Hello listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. I'm your speaker, Casey, and before we get started, I just wanted to let everybody know that there is a competition being run across my social media pages at the moment where you can win yourself a Google Mini Nest to listen to my podcast around the house, and what better way to listen? So if you'd be interested in being in for a chance to win the Google Mini Nest, all you have to do is share my post or retweet my post or follow me on Instagram. It's uh, it's across all three social media pages, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And, uh, and there's one up for grabs and I can send it anywhere in the world to one lucky winner. So please get in touch and help me build my social media following, which will help this platform hugely and get the messages out to more and more people. This is the final instalment for Pentecostalism across the month of January before I move on to Scientology for February. I just wanted to give everyone a warning um, and a heads up that this episode does have sensitive themes. It includes child abuse and molestation and, uh, and some of the topics that we discussed today are going to be quite heavy and quite difficult for some people to listen to, so discretion is advised. But it's so important that these issues of abuse are highlighted, even if it's only on this small platform. So today I bring you my interview with Sam. Hi, Sam, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me today. We are covering Pentecostalism for the duration of January, and you have an interesting story to tell our listeners about uh, different variations of Pentecostalism that you experienced throughout your childhood. So would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners and let them know a little bit about who you are? Sure. Um, I'm Sam. I live in uh, Athens, Ohio, which is located in uh, the U.S. And uh, it's a small college town, uh, rural area, Uh, pretty much grew up in this sort of thing. Um, For 15 years, I was a chef. And most recently, due to COVID, I sort of just moved over to uh, the medical uh, cannabis industry. Um, That's what I do now. (laughs) Um, I'm also, yeah, on the verge of starting a podcast. And uh, yeah. (laughs) Which is super exciting and definitely something that we are going to talk about a little bit more um, once we really get into things. Uh, but you you just mentioned there that you're in the US and for anybody that's listening to this episode today, we've just had the whole thing around um, people storming the Capitol in the name of Donald Trump. And it's been interesting to say the least from, from our perspective to watch the news over here and see things unfolding in America. So what's what's the atmosphere like in the general area that you live in? Um, so it's a, it's, it's very, it's kind of weird, right? Um, we, this, the town that I live, like the city or town that I live in is basically super, um, you know, blue, like li- liberal um, leaning, but w- the surrounding is super red. Like we are literally like, a blue speck in the middle of a sea okay. and okay. in, in in like our state um you know i i can literally drive you know five miles down the road and there are still trump 2020 signs flags things of like this being out you know um a lot of you, you can't stop into a gas station without hearing someone complaining and saying that oh it's you know this or that um it's i'm definitely left-leaning which is very against (laughs) obviously the pentecostalism belief but uh yeah (laughs) it's family is is weird too because like i've been on you know i've been unfriended by family just because you know i have a and i've unfriended family (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. it's it's interesting especially um with the um super devout trump supporters um, this whole thing growing with QAnon um, and you can go on the QAnon casualties subreddit and there's just every day tens of stories of people who have had to stop contact with husbands or wives or mums and brothers, sisters, children um, because they just can't 
seem to um, talk about anything other than Trump and how the election was stolen and, um, you know, that Biden's a criminal and we'll all see in four years time, you know, that he'll run the country into the ground. And it's just, it's interesting. It's interesting to watch um, and to read the stories, but also obviously very tragic at the same time, because we're going to talk a lot today about uh, religious differences and spiritual differences, but obviously this is political political differences. Um, so I wonder if there's anybody in your community or neighbourhood that actually went to these rallies. Um, if if they're I, they're very I, kind I, of red. I, I honestly don't know um, anyone personally. Um, you know, I like as far as within my community, but I, I know at least one artist. Uh, who was like a, a musician um, he was you know that I followed and and sort of has this like voice of peace love harmony hip, you know sort of that more hippie like played the hippie festival sort mm-hmm, of thing mm-hmm. um, and was there and just blew everyone's mind he's it, it's 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 I yeah it's, it's definitely it's it's become an everyday conversation Mm -hmm. um it's tearing families apart because you know if you try to have some sort of intellectual debate or or something it's it's attack after attack after attack like there's no like it's a per it's personal attacks and a lot of times i feel like a lot of it stems from christianity like the the that far right movement of christianity as well because it's a very authoritarian sort of um thing and it's if you if you're not doing it right they're going to point out what you're doing wrong you Mm -hmm. know and if you don't if you don't follow what they do then they attack you or it's it's narcissism Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's there's so (laughs) there's so much it's so yeah lots of there seems to be yeah very lots of judging and 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 And, that 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 mentality for sure but um but they we're... talk about separation of church and state, but it's like, okay, well, they think in their mind that separation, I'm sorry, but they think no, no, it's is, okay. Okay. They think that, you know, the separation of church and state means that like, well, we can't have the government telling us what to do, but like, no, like it's about not having a religion or like a church telling religion, like what, or politics, what to do, like you, keep it out. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I, yeah. Like, believe what you want to believe. Like, I'm okay with that. But, like, don't don't try to attack me because or, or change my political views. You know, yeah. like, oh, it's like you're mad that uh, you that you're being banned on Facebook and that your little app like Parler got like taken off. But yet you want to control what a woman does with her body. Like, come, yes, come yeah, fuck yeah. on, dude. Like, it's, it's very double standards, isn't it? It's very... It um, um, and the standards are way more relaxed for men than they are women, yeah. even in that context. Like, That's just one example politics, of it. You can see it in the Christianity. Like, yeah, abs- oh, yeah, absolutely, definitely. And, and it, you know, the, a lot of, of what's coming over here through my echo chamber, um, so obviously listeners probably know by now that I'm also left-leaning, um and you know kind of i'm more for um you know the labor party and democracy than i am for um you know right wing um views and beliefs um i don't know if that's just because i grew up working class or or what's influenced that decision um but a lot of people are making comments about how the black lives matter protests were peaceful and they were to raise awareness for, you know, the unjust killing of somebody by a member of the police force um, and people of colour's lives overall and the treatment of people of colour across America and the world. And, and then those same people that want to, you know speak the way they do on Facebook and not have their Facebook pages banned or be banned from Twitter are also the same people that say all lives matter um you know it we shouldn't have protests just to highlight the unjust things that happen to people of color um which I find really interesting because uh there's been no 
white people that we know of who have died the way George Floyd did. Um, and that's the whole point. Um, so I just find that interesting. It's, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole can of worms. It, but... it really is because, you know, from, you try to stay, you know, critical with critical thinking as much as possible, right? But when you're getting information from Facebook and you're getting information from social, you know, like these social media platforms such as Instagram and other things, you know, these things are algorithms. And a lot of, a lot of right, you know, leaning folks and especially the older generation like you know the folks that are in their 60s to 70s believe that that I, I think that they believe that facebook is basically like an editorial sort of thing right like there's an editor mm -hmm. there's one person who is sitting at the top of it like an editor at a newspaper and mm -hmm. he's just filtering what this is the real news but it's like no yeah you know the, yeah. The social media is based on like what you click what you yeah. are interested <clears throat> in sort of mm -hmm. thing right and then at the same time we're all we're not we're not set up to think critically while we're on facebook right because facebook and other social media is this emotional thing where we are wanting to see the um you know, we're seeing people's lives essentially, mm -hmm, right? And mm -hmm. so we're seeing pictures and different things, and so I think it's like that trigger of the brain. Yeah, not... yeah, it's it's all algorithms. And again, you know, I spoke about my echo chamber before, and and that's what basically social media is, and that's why it's so um, interesting when you see a news article uh, about Trump being impeached, for example. Um, and there'll be one or two comments that will talk about how um, he's the greatest president that the world has ever had. Um, and again, that's not, they're not the views that, that people that I generally associate with would have. But it's interesting then because that's the crossover between what people on my friends list might disagree with and how others are viewing that article. Um, and and that, that's the only time I really come across people that oppose left wing articles um, or things that, that that are just talking about the news in general. So it's 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 really I don't know. I just feel it's like a rabbit hole. It is, and it's been like that for years. It's been like that since I don't know, like a few years back when we had a like a a snap election that came out of nowhere and nobody knew how it was going to go. And some people were like, it'll go this way. It'll go that way. And I just feel like since then, social media has like changed to be this platform where people will talk about their political views and anybody that disagrees with them is just wrong. And that's that, that's the end of the discussion. Um, right. So it's, it's exhausting in a way. Um, but yeah, um, enough about that let's talk about you i want to i want to learn all about you sam so you were born into the the movement is that right yes that is uh that is correct um i had it goes all the way back to uh, a great great grandparent on one side and a great grandparents on another um that the church has been involved within our family that as far as I know, um, mm -hmm. you know, as far as them being considered what they would, you know, want to call themselves apostolic or Pentecost. So I believe there was an assemblies of God, I believe was in one of the greats, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Again, when I ask these questions of family, like it's been kind of <laughs> because they understand what's going on. It's been got, it's gotten out that what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. things have started to like cinch up like information essentially. But. Okay. Okay. So you've got two different branches of Pentecostalism, one on one mm -hmm. side of the family, one on the other. So how do your parents meet for you to, you know, for you to be born? I, I believe it was just at a, at a random like church converse, like church thing. Um, 
that one that the kids were going to you know like the young people would travel around to like different churches and they would meet that way and okay. so um like even that information for me and I wish I would have gotten more information about how like my parents would have met really but like I just know it was you know obviously like through church and they're I mean they're now divorced too so there's no like when my when I talk to my mother there's no like oh it was like a great <laughs> yeah this great thing so yeah yeah, um, yeah. and was it just yourself I mean, or or have you got brothers and sisters I do have uh, one younger brother. There are 12 years difference between the two of us. Um, And my mother had had a few miscarriages um, ahead of me. Right. Okay. Okay. I believe three, she had lost twins and then one other, one other child. Oh, so you were like a rainbow child for them. Uh, Yeah. I mean, my name um, is Samuel and I guess apparently that is translated a gift from God. Like apparently, um, you know, there was just no reason for them to have, the story uh, this is the story I've always heard okay the story goes that my dad was at one time an x-ray tech and he was changing I guess like the x-ray stuff like mm-hmm. um, the radiation bars mm-hmm. and like his his suit split open and he was burnt and so oh, wow. he was never able to have like supposed to father children or something no idea if any of that's true <laughs> but then it was like okay well um yeah like they were married in 1973 and then I was born in in 1984 so they had been trying to have children wow yeah but yeah for almost a decade that's such a long time isn't it yeah and you know it is and you know I I just wonder I again you know it baffles me like I wonder like what you know she was thinking at the time or he you know when you hear these different stories from your parents and it's like yeah well, yeah know, I how imagine. do you know <laughs> any of this is true I mean yeah. you know it's not they make it more glamorous in a sense than how I was actually born I mean I was born in a, in a single wide trailer on an 80 acre farm you know my mother was born in a hospital my grandmother was born in a hospital but I was born at home, <laughs> you know, and, and my mother's older brother was born in a hospital. Mm-hmm. Her, her next youngest sister was born in a hospital, but then the rest of the kids were all born on the farm. Okay. So, that's interesting. Right. That's, yeah. That's... And there's other kids who were born on the farm and there was like some women who, there was a woman who passed away during childbirth because apparently she was being forced to deliver a stillborn child and so she passed away they buried they were buried out on the farm for a long time like the mother and the baby and then finally like the family had the body like removed and Mm. put into like an actual like cemetery but there are still um yeah I got I grabbed a couple pictures last time I was out there but there is still like gravesite out there that is it's so, it's so strange creepy. isn't it yeah I, and mm. and the trauma for the parents to have to exhume the body and and um so there's an 80 acre farm and am I right in thinking that this is the farm that belonged to your grandfather yes and is that your mother's or father's? yeah this would be my uh, mother's father your mother's um, father right mm-hmm. my father's father was in was across in another state so in West Virginia okay so you had more contact with your mother's side of the family and her faith than you did with your father's at a very early age yes so from 84 to 93 we lived in Ohio Um, but then my grandmother on my dad's side passed away and my grandfather on my dad's side was in a wheelchair who was the pastor of the church over there. Um, so we moved to take care of him in a sense, I guess. Um, you know, we lived over there for, uh, for about seven years. I mean, family, there was a bunch of drama the entire time we lived there. Um, you know, within the church, outside the church, within the family, like it's, it was that was crazy so we live and then we moved back to ohio because of again just drama and so we moved back to ohio and uh then i had that was 2000 
And so then that's when I had a lot of my later, like junior year, senior year of high school um, was mainly into like, yeah, the, the apostolic side. Again. Right. Okay. Okay. So you mentioned in, in some of your writing to me that your, your grandfather who had this 80 acre farm, um, he was a, he was a, a charismatic man who was also a preacher or pastor. Yeah, he was the pastor of a church um, that the church was originally the church was in the, the, the town where I live, which is called Athens, Ohio. So mm -hmm. um, I think the church started around like, I believe it was in like 50 in the early 50s at some point. And then in the early 70s, they moved out to the farm. Okay, so all of the all of the faith's operation in, in terms of your granddad's involvement was happening on the farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at this he point had a time. vision of turning this farm into a community of some type. <laughs> yeah, there was legit a community. So um, basically he had a, a church building. Okay. And that was at the bottom of this hill. And then so like in this little like valley sort of thing because i mean we're at the appalachian foothills so it's very rolling hills right so there's mm -hmm. just very many um i'm so just thinking anyway, of um this. thinking of fallout now just picturing it right. from... oh yeah it's very good <laughs> <laughs> so um where you know there's there's the church building and then you know the main entrance of the church building is is like say you're facing it and then to the right of this is another building Mm -hmm. um that was a school that was the christian school and then to the left of this building what to, of the church building was this uh they called it we always growing up called it the tabernacle and this is where they would have like church services like outside so like my grandfather would also host these like youth camps and so like church summer camp sort of things and so oh my goodness hang yeah. on hang on somebody messaged me this morning on reddit and said can you this is weird. Can you look into the Faith Tabernacle in Junction City in Kansas? I don't know if that has any link, but that was just weird that somebody would have messaged me that this morning. <laughs> where Where is Kansas in relation to you? Is that like anywhere near where you are? Uh, Kansas is a few states away. That's probably, right, okay. I would say, about a eight to ten hour trip, maybe. Yeah, so and it's like, probably you know, just a, 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 a religious buzzword of some type then okay okay yeah. continue so you've got the church the school the tabernacle right, right. and then behind the tabernacle like further down the little hill or whatever is like a like a few of these little cottage sort of buildings and these would be like where my grandfather would have like some of the churches uh some of the preachers stay um in the bottom of the actual church sanctuary there was a basement and there was a bunch of rooms aligned in there as well um and so like preachers would come and stay inside these like little rooms um uh, you know any of the off time of like normal you know like when there wasn't like special services or the, or the church camp going on um there was actually a guy like a couple people he allowed to like live there and stuff so mm, mm -hmm. and there was also like where i like we lived on the property as well like there was um my the home that i lived in and then there next door was like this other home well they were trailers like little caravan trailers i guess right so <laughs> um like single wide trailers is what we lived in yeah and so next to these trailers there was like this other building and like the name of it was called the old folks home like that's just how i grew up no it never became a finished project but it was originally supposed to be another building to where like you know if there were old people who you know people's parents like the idea or the the the, the vision i should say would be a place for older people to have so that they wouldn't be just like thrown out on the street or miscared for. Right. Okay. So, you know, I believe a lot of, and, and I want to like preface all this, like whatever I say about my grandfather, like I believe at some instance, like he had like 
a giving spirit or like, like okay. they called her, right? Like he was very kind spirited. He, right. he, he could be, he was very generous, but like that, with that generosity, what I've learned, like came a price, right? Which is like, if I do this for mm-hmm. you, yeah, of course, then yeah, you have to go and do, you yeah. have to like put an hour in mowing the church hill, like yard in the church, whatever, right? Like it was always like, whatever you, whatever I, I have this to give, but you have to work for it. Okay. Or yeah. you have to like give back in some way. Right. Which, which in a sense isn't a terrible, in, in some perspectives, right? Like, isn't a terrible life. Like if I live here for free, I can, and if I work and I take care of things, I can live here for free. Yeah. Or, or sort of thing so yeah. yeah I don't know <laughs> it's 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 always it's always dependent on the types of things that are being asked of you though and if those things change in nature uh, which is something right. that I was going to mention next um so your your grandfather has this 80 acre farm and he obviously has a, a vision for this farm it sounds at some point like he's almost running like a almost like a a monastery or a nunnery um, and I know you you mentioned that it was preachers that would come and stay and uh, not monks and and nuns but um it's weird that specifically it would be that 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 caliber of person that he would have come and stay um on the property um and do you do you think that you know they moved to the farm in the 70s and, and then you're born in the 80s so do you think that there's like a decade there of, 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 of almost like progression in your grandfather's devotion to his faith, where his mentality changes to the point where he's thinking all the women must have the children on the farm, on the property, you know, by the time it's, it's time for your mom to go into labor with you. Yeah. It's a very, uh, like when I, when I talked to my mom and I realized that happened with her, my, you know, the, the hospital versus being born in the farm sort of thing. That's, it was the first time that that ever clicked. And this is just recent, like last week sort of thing mm-hmm, that, that mm-hmm. I had talked to her about this. And so, yeah, like it was just this, I, I say that it just became like deeper, you know, he had more people to control in a sense from, from what you know the other perspective is now like it was basically this control thing so like he had there were more people I think associated with the church family but then you know as things progressively got more controlling people would leave or you know one thing that got said to me you know that someone commented to me uh, when I'm asking about these things is like what you know misogyny aside what man would want another man to tell him how to rule his house or his marriage Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and and maybe that if if there was like a healthy but like you know it's not a healthy way to like um learn how to how to have a marriage in a sense in in my opinion like Mm -hmm. i'm not even i'm not even i'm not even for it because i've seen so many marriage like things nitpicked around marriage and and people stay in these 40 you know my parents alone were you know in a marriage for 40 years but the reason why was because you know my mom was afraid honestly to be alone Mm -hmm. for the rest of her life because her thing was well I won't be allowed to remarry yep and divorce is a sin and Mm -hmm. and you know if you take certain because I know um that a big thing about Pentecostalism is that the scriptures are taken literally um, you know, and there are some it's things in white. there, yeah, that will talk about how uh, a woman should serve a man, um, and 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 that type of, of thing. So, it's it's um, difficult. Is they use the King James version of the Bible too, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Which is not written, which was rewritten not too long ago. Like, yeah, yeah. To include the parts about homosexuality being a sin and things like that. Right, so. when it was actually talking about pedophilia. But hey, we mm-hmm. have that running rampant in the... Exactly, and I spoke about this in the episode that I released yesterday, interestingly enough. Um, so I mean, I'm a victim myself. Like, there's myself, there's uh, my cousin. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, 
pull too many you know name i'm not saying names but i'm just mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know it yeah and is, is that pretty... something that happened during your first stint in ohio before you yes. moved in in 93 yeah yeah this was my first stint in ohio this was um uh from a family member okay who is, who is now serving time for assaulting his own children as well okay and other okay. children and other like there were other fo- other children Goodness. as well but um yeah he uh yeah it's uh it's it's sad but then you know even recently a younger cousin of mine too you know like a few years ago it mm-hmm. was from uh it wasn't a member of their church but they had like this special service where a bunch of churches came together and it was a member of another church who oh my goodness you know and i don't even know if this i don't even know if my cousin has been through therapy or anything or whatever you know i don't i don't know anything about my other cousins either you know the two whose dad's in prison like i Mm -hmm. don't know it's not really talked about which is another big part of of you know of these these type of faith-based movements um people who find themselves in positions of power are often not held accountable for their actions and will use the faith to justify the heinous things they do against other people especially children who are the most vulnerable and need and need guidance and protection so the fact that this person, this horrible monster, is actually serving time for the things that they have done is it's not going to change anything that happened. And it's probably not really going to help, um, especially in terms of recovery for the victims. But at least it's something. At least he, you know, at least he is being held accountable in some way for the things that he has done because I cannot even begin to imagine the amount of people that are out there that have done similar things and will never uh, be held accountable. First, this is my first pub, like public announcement of this. Uh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional. No, it's this, okay. But, it's, it's hard. It's hard it's, for me to um, even. Uh, think about let alone uh, for you to um, to relive um so like my my mother doesn't know uh you know he he wasn't tried based on me you know or anything and mm-hmm. i'm mm-hmm. but i've just come to the terms that like you know uh he's certain uh, what what like Telling my mother would wouldn't really help anything, honestly, you know. And maybe one day I will, but I don't know. Like I just I haven't come to that. Do you? you know. Why do you think you never mentioned it to her? Do you think it's because you thought that she wouldn't believe you, or that she wouldn't? Um, she'd just say, "Well, there's nothing that I can do about it," or or is it because you're taught? to to um you know follow your leaders blindly without questioning what what they do and um what, what do you have you thought about maybe why you haven't spoken to her about it yeah i i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that she has experienced her own trauma within the church okay. and within and within the marriage of my father and stuff and and nothing again physical with for her that I know of, but, mm-hmm. you know, em- emotionally abusive, um, psycho, like just mm-hmm. berate her, tell her she wasn't, you know, good enough. And, you know, tell her she wouldn't be able to succeed. Like she, I remember one time she wanted to go back to school to be a nurse. And my, my dad pretty much told her that she was too dumb. And, you know, it's, it's me, I guess it's that guilt too. You know, like, I don't want to put any more onto my mom, you know, like, mm-hmm. I don't want her to like have to deal with that at this point. Like, she is just, I feel like she's dealt with enough. And, you know, that's also been a question arised, like, by family member, other family members with me, like, you know, are you, when I'm talking about asking these questions to, to do my, you know, my own thing, like, or yeah, whatever, yeah. Like, are, are you doing this to like hurt people and, 
and things. And I, I don't think, I mean, I know that that's not my intentions, but you know, I'm dealing with my own pain. Of and my course. Own trauma. Yeah. 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 So, but I'm also not trying to spread that around. I'm not trying to dig up, you know, old, old bones, I guess. Yeah. But, it's, I mean, it's interesting because you're on your own journey of discovery and understanding and healing. And, and for you, the way to do that might be to ask these questions and talk through these things and, you know, write your podcast episodes and speak to other people that have had these similar situations. And if people aren't willing to ask you if that's what you need um, to heal, to recover, um, you know, and the, and the first question is whether you're out to harm somebody else um i don't know if they're the the types of people that you need to help you on that journey in the first place if if that makes sense oh it makes yeah i mean it makes total sense Mm -hmm. and i have pretty much these are folks that i've had to just you know uh, you just figure out that are toxic and whether they're family or not like you have to take care of yourself Mm -hmm. you know you mm-hmm. have to, you have have to you, do what's best for your own mental yeah state. you absolutely do you absolutely do and and have you sought out any um therapy or professional help with with all of the stuff that's happened yeah i've been um in cons- i've been to therapy cons- like on a consistent basis now for the past uh, two and a half years okay and do you um, think that's that's helped oh tremendously tremendously and i i you know the guy that i see he's a oh man um he's the type of counselor who deals with like your environment okay. as opposed to like more or less like you know your mental like state right like you know he he could treat you if you have bipolar but like i don't have bipolar but i have you know anxiety. i've been diagnosed with anxiety depression and ptsd mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so you know these are these can be chemical imbalances but also for me i've just had to realize that like also a big part of it has been my environment mm-hmm. and you know, obviously the environment that I grew up in and the environment that I still surrounded myself in with the same type of people who all I did was try to achieve this like uh, acceptance because, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe they were glad, I don't know, maybe they, whatever it was, like just always trying to feel, um, you know, accepted within a community or accepted within somebody because, you're told your entire life that like the world won't accept you because you've, you've been, you're, you know, you'll always be a child of God or you've, you know, once you've been in the church, like that you won't, you won't ever succeed without God. And like all these things are, are told to you, you know, and it's yeah. like, I've struggled with that. Like I've owned a business, you know, and the business failed as, you know, a result to a water catastrophe in West Virginia. Like that's when I was living there as an adult. Um, but like, you know, I, I attributed a lot of that to <laughs> because I didn't have God in my side or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, and that was 2016. I I do remember speaking to um I I did an interview very early on in the podcast with a um two people called Amelia and David and they were both from different uh, branches of episode. yeah they're both from different branches of uh, Pentecostalism and you might remember both of them having a little bit of rapport over um when there would be like a a crash of thunder outside and. Amelia talked about how she would start panicking because she thought that, you know, that hell, hell was going to, you know, the ground was going to open up and swallow her. And she genuinely was so fearful that that was going to happen. And still to this day, she says, you know, some things will happen where she's like, oh, no, it, here it comes. It's it's happening. Here it comes. Um, so, like, you know, you, you just mentioned a, about, you know, 2016 and still thinking that that was because you didn't have god by your side but you you grew up on this farm with this man who was very charismatic had a vision for his farm to become its own commune and and by the sounds of it from what you described um 
almost succeeded in that vision as well, you know, had the different properties and buildings and almost made it with the, with the school being there, a self-sealed environment where he was at the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I mean, did, did you attend that school? So you were homeschooled? No, I, that's, that was one of the other um, things that, you know, I wondered was why wasn't I homeschooled? Cause I started out public school. I went to, you know, K through 12. I've always gone to public school and, you know, my mom, she, not only like she went to public school for her first few years, but she was, but it was her senior year and she graduated. She was the first senior to graduate from the Christian school. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. From the Christian school on the farm. Right. And so she was, she was in public school up until her, like her 11th grade year. And then mm -hmm. she was pulled and she was the first. Yeah. Interesting. First. That sounds like it was almost by design. Oh, it was done by godly design. That's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's that is that is really interesting. Um, so did you? I mean, that you, you might think differently about it now, but I mean, you, you spoke about striving for this acceptance, um, you know, for your for the duration of your childhood. Um, so did you see attending public school as something that was stopping you from? being fully accepted in that community because you weren't part of the school that was on the farm. Yes. Um, you know, my mother, of course, you know, had had 10 years. So it was 28 when she had me. Mm. So, you know, around this time a year, I, you know, I, I've always believed that, um, that women are, you know, sometimes they, they can, um, what's the word like mature faster and maybe mm -hmm. come to like some realization faster than men so like yeah you know I think at this point that my mom was like well if I have a kid because she felt inadequate about her education okay I yeah believe, yeah and felt that she was ignorant to a lot of things because I mean she but she worked at um, a major bank corporation like she's about to retire in in February you know and so but she has been the same job for the entire time okay okay <clears throat> you know so she was a bank teller and so you know she felt like I don't know you know she just felt inadequate about her education so she never really moved out of that sort of entry level bank like whether it was at the bank or she worked at this one place that you know they they uh did accounts receivables and so she was like a data entry person or whatever okay. and so she was able to do that as well, you know, but she just never had the, she never had the confidence, like the mm -hmm. self-confidence to, to achieve it. Do you think that that's her education that she received while she was at public school or the, the, the final part of her education that she received at the farm and maybe yeah. not, not pursuing further education? I think it was the final fact that, you know, mm -hmm because eventually the school got shut down right okay. because the um school board like superintendent sort of people came against my grandfather um when it was like there was like you know things of abuse um these sorts of things were coming out um you know not being able to pass you know certain standardized tests you mm -hmm. know folks weren't being able to um like essentially like if a kid left the 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 christian school and went to public school they were almost like two years behind in a right sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and so she saw that and so with all that closed down like yeah when i was a child like super young the school was still in, like going on but she just never sent me there okay like, so at the time you're probably thinking why won't you let me go to the you know to to to, to that place but she was thinking of doing you a favor by yeah taking you to public school i believe so yeah and i suppose is. now do you feel like some of your um not resistance to the faith, but withdrawal from the faith comes from the experiences that you had at public school that were outside of that self sealing system. I, I think so because I never because I was I had to dress differently. I was never accepted in in you know within 
that either like don't get me wrong like as i got older because i could i figured out a way to sort of manipulate the clothing in a sense too right Mm -hmm. because also as the time that i was in like middle school and like the early parts of high school you know we were living in west virginia where the law where the rules for dress and the rules for different things were a little bit less strict okay right and so you know i don't know it was just kids made fun of you know not only the weight because i mean i was i was also like a fat kid (laughs) but like um yeah like they still made fun of like the way i dress because i would wear long sleeves out in the summertime you Mm -hmm. know long pants in the summertime um you know if if we were all would go swimming with my with some of the kids and go swim at the creek like we would have on long clothes like yeah. at the you know what I'm saying like you'd come up from underneath the water with a t-shirt over your head you can't breathe like yeah <laughs> it's you're like claustrophobic you know or whatever like it's like uh it's terrible but it's for modesty's sake oh exactly it's for modesty's sake you know mm. it's like not so for safety kids are kids are evil anyway because a lot of the time they're gonna they're gonna pick on children for any sort right. of difference that they can find and and a lot of the time kids will make fun of things that they don't understand. So right. when they're all wearing shorts and you're wearing long pants, that's something that's easily identifiable for a child as obviously different. And mm-hmm. I talk a lot about these ostracizing experiences that um, you know children have in school when they're in such a... Um, you know, such a faith-based movement um, that it can have a long lasting impact on, on the way that you view yourself, I guess, you know, like I I would be worried about if I decided to go to college or if I decided to get a job and would I get the same reaction from people outside of my religion that don't understand why I wear long pants in the summer. Right. And I mean, I have cousins, you know, I have a cousin who's a nurse and, you know, um, a couple other women are, you know, different things and they're, they have to be allowed to wear their dresses, you know I mean? But they're not, it's not like they're out working in a meat packing plant or, you know, something where, Mm -hmm. you know, they're not working a fry station, you know, where their legs could get easily burnt or, you know, I'm not seeing that, but I mean, I'm seeing, you know, they're also just more tempted to most of the time led to do jobs that are like behind at a bank or yep. a secretarial, or I've seen a lot of that, like within if, if, uh, or, um, I believe one of the ladies in our church, she converted from Jehovah's witness and she was a teacher. She was a, uh, um, a cook, like a school cook. <laughs> yeah yeah but but there's not a lot of oh i'm a doctor i'm a lawyer i'm this but like yeah i don't know there's no it's a lot of poor uneducated people and you know they don't believe in the apostolic side of of the pentecostalism they don't believe in tv like i so you know for the first I've never, my mom has never owned a TV in the house. Like there's never been a TV. There has been a monitor, right? Like where we, like at one point we could watch like certain videos, but like, you know, and even though the church believed, some of the churches believed in having cable, right? Cable TV, like Mm -hmm. we we never, we never did. Did you ever go to anybody's house when you were growing up and find it like fascinating when they had a TV? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, I, my first experience with a TV in a house was that, um, you know, my mom started going back to was working, right? Like, and when I would go to school, she would take me up the road to the, our neighbor's house. And the lady had two kids and she would watch, you know, like babysat me or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so I would get off of school there, off from school there as well. But in the mornings, I got to watch uh teenage mutant ninja turtles awesome so, like even as like as an adult to this day i fucking love teenage mutant ninja turtles <laughs> even though i missed like an entire like i have no idea like i wasn't able to get like as in depth with 
the TV shows and, and yeah. things because I didn't have I didn't have it all the time. But mm-hmm. like, you know, those little things and there was like this other old like little TV show like it was called James Bond Junior. Like I don't know, it was weird. Like, um, and GI Joe. Like that's what I remember. You yeah. Know, sort of in the mornings that's awesome but. though because that that just like um it's it's just proof that there are some things that had such a positive impact on your well-being that you still enjoy them to this day yeah, you know ninja, um yeah ninja turtles like yeah <laughs> absolutely that you, i mean you probably looked forward to those those times of the day more than oh, more than anything else like i can't wait to go around there and watch some tv it's it's probably why I'm such an early bird. Like, yeah, yeah, I can see. Yeah, I could see. I could see how that would happen. Yeah, because literally, like, wake up and I'm like, my brain is like firing at a hundred like miles an hour as soon as I wake up in the morning. So. It's. I think I, I. I. In in the episode I released yesterday with uh, April, who was in the Assembly of God, she spoke about how difficult it was growing up, um, and even when she was an adult, you know, people would be like oh you know about Justin Timberlake because he was in NSYNC when you were younger and she'd be like I what I have no idea what you've just said in that whole sentence because she didn't know who NSYNC were she didn't know who Justin Timberlake was um so that's you know this is just another example of pop culture that we take for granted in in everyday life that some children just don't have access to and don't even know exist yeah my mom's brother who is the current pastor of the church that she goes to and is my grandpa's old my grandfather's old church um all his all three of his kids homeschooled um all three of them um he has a this is the youngest one is also being homeschooled and he's like 12 it's hard it's hard i can see that the pros and cons of of homeschooling right i can't i I can't too but you still have to be social right you do because there are rites of passage when you're a child um you know experiences that you that you should have or that you should you know that that i suppose are restricted or even forsaken if you are being educated from home um and then most likely don't have the opportunity to socialize with people outside of the faith um even if they're you know oh like i'm gonna go to tommy's house down the road because you're encouraged to stay away from people right. who who aren't saved or who who can't be saved because they don't have and, the word of god and where we lived i mean we were out in the middle of nowhere essentially yeah. right yeah. um and again that was until we moved to west virginia and like there the 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 experience was completely different like for church wide like kind of stuff i mean you know even the women could like their dresses could be a little bit shorter like they didn't have to be all the way down to the ankles um the sleeves were could be at three-quarter length instead of like full um you know they could wear things in their hair like hair like my mom could finally wear like a hair like a bow or a hair bread or whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sc- a scrunchie i think that was another one from back in the day or something but um yeah it was just it was completely different do you think that this the severity of the restrictions that that were that were put on the 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 men and the women the women's especially were they a product of your of your grandfather or was that just ohio in general i know ohio is part of the bible belt and and religion's a hot topic over there yeah Um, i (laughs) i i don't I don't know where I think a lot of it came from just like more I don't know like more just Puritan sort of belief like my mom would tell me stories of how some but there were also preachers involved in Kentucky uh, preachers involved in Indiana preachers involved in Michigan so like all the surrounding like states or whatever right like they're they would all can like get together and they were all sort of believed the same thing like no Christmas you know, and these sort of things, but I, I don't know. No, no, no. Little... <laughs> it's, it's just, that's just something that, that, that I was just speculating there when you were, when you were talking about it, but um, I just wanted to go back to the school quickly. So before it was closed down, um, mm-hmm. do you know what the types of curriculum they were teaching? Because 
I, I I'm just interested to know if it was like faith based curriculum or whether they actually followed like a statutory curriculum that was set out by the education board. There, there was a certain <clears throat> one. Now it has actually been sort of defunct. I think now, right? Like it's, it's the organization is gone. So basically, my mom's diploma is kind of non-existent. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, but there are some of these that are regulated and, but I think the one that they were with basically just kind of was like, oh, you know, they're teaching math, but they teach it on a base with like shekels. <laughs> you know okay. what I'm saying? Like, like, it, like they use like Bible terminology mm -hmm. in the lessons mm -hmm. and in the lesson books and stuff. And so it would be like, you know, if you had 30, if Eve, would have eaten 30 apples i don't know like that's <laughs> that's me trying to be funny but like yeah i don't it, it was more like elementary like <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that we'd be in a, a lot of trouble if eve ate 30 apples right i mean Would look you? where we are already after just one mm -hmm. so um, his dark materials she could yeah. <laughs> so you were born in 1784 right 84 um i'm 37 i just turned 37 like last week congratulations thanks <laughs> <laughs> so i made it yeah you're born in 84 and then just under 10 years later you move and what what happens in that 10 year period Do, does your grandfather kind of does does he does his congregation grow smaller in that time? Does it grow bigger? Um, it definitely you know, ebbs and flows, I would say. Okay, okay. Like, so right, like there are periods of like, oh, like uh, say a new family, a poor, a poor family, a homeless family, for instance, that we had. Okay, fair enough. A homeless family comes, somehow hears about, you know, whatever. Grandpa allows them to stay in the bottom of the church, mm -hmm. in the basement, you know, in the rooms um the guy kind of does things around or whatever he gets back on his feet but at the time yeah. it was like him and two kids were living in a car like his wife and two kids were living in a car like a pinto it was a ford pinto I remember. so it sounds like what you mentioned before like he he seems like a, a very generous person who's just trying to you know bring around positive change for people that might have but if you yeah, don't go to the church, luck. you're kicked out, right? right like, but okay. if you don't go to the church, then you get kicked out. Like, if you decide, oh, I'm not going to do this, then all support, everything is withdrawn, and then you're basically homeless again. Okay, and what what happens that within that church to make it so difficult to remain a part of it? I mean, I think just the regular restrictions of, like, you know, you're going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night. Yep. You're going to church on Tuesday. You're going to church on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then once a month, there's church services on Friday and then the Saturday. Okay. And so there's just so much church. But then it's like, well, all these other things that are supposed to be a sin, right, that you're supposed to with abstain from. Mm -hmm. Basically, I mean, you know, what happens to young people when they leave the church for the first time? I mean, a lot of us go crazy. A lot of, mm -hmm. it, you know, as, they, as you would call it, like we try to you know, we drink, some of us turn into alcoholics, you know, some of us turn to other harder drugs, some of us have turned to what food, whatever it is, there's, there's, what's missing is the addiction. Mm -hmm. you know, there's not like, what's missing isn't, isn't God, what's missing is that addiction, in my opinion, right. And so I feel like, yeah, like that just, uh, I don't know, I get lost in my own ramblings. No, that does, that does make right. sense, though, I suppose, like, if you're, so uh, routine based as well and then all of a sudden that routine's not there it's almost like well what do I do now to fill my time like there's mm -hmm. there's nothing here to kind of keep me not in check so to speak right which um, is why it's easy for them to have success stories such as like well you know we God has taken care of the alcoholic or God has taken care mm -hmm. of the drug addict or you know they don't do that no more well it's because they found a new addiction and they found something new that 
that gives them some sort of self gratification. It's that it's that love, it's that acceptance, right? That they've yeah. been trying to find and in, in that empty bottle and in that needle or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so then they are able to to focus on other yeah. on something else. And I feel I, I feel a lot of recovery houses and things for rehabs. It's it's set up that same exact way for you to to like follow this like Christian moral thing or whatever i suppose as well it's it's a way for some people to escape some of the experiences they've had like you mentioned with the family member who is serving time in prison um you know some people who have this type of abuse inflicted on them um who who don't have access to therapy or don't think to seek out professional help Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I will will turn to other ways to to manage, you know, to cope, um, because I imagine that it must be unbearable. I mean, I've been um, I checked my in 2007, I checked myself into a uh, rehab mental health hospital um, because I was having such terrible nightmares about you know, I had moved out to, I had moved um, across the country, had left my family, everything Mm -hmm. that I knew behind my best friend who I had grown up with in church. And even after I had left church, I was in, he allowed me to be in his wedding, which was his dad's super cool because his dad's a pastor too. Right. But this, it was super awesome. I was able to be like the best man in his wedding. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause I know there's a lot of They made me shave. They made me shave though. I couldn't have my beard. <laughs> that was like the one stipulation was I had to shave in order yeah. to like you know, in order to be allowed on the pulpit. So like um but he at the age of twenty, we were twenty-three and he had passed away at the age of twenty-three unexpectedly, oh right? Oh, no. And so you know, that was probably the breaking point for me of actually thinking that there was no God. Mm. Or, or or at least having that thought and i'm not and i'm even at this point i'm not like saying there isn't mm-hmm. because i don't i don't know but like you know there it was like around that time that i started feeling my severance really coming on and i went through you know losing him and and literally already had planned to move and so i had moved a week later and had found myself you know drinking way too much um I mean, all the drugs, cocaine, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, substances, all sorts. (laughs) So found myself in a rehab mental hospital. And then I came back and got sucked right back into church because they used, they used all that against me with the guilt and losing my friend and all this stuff. And you know, even his mother, I had seen his mom once and she had mentioned, because she was a pastor's wife too, right? Like, but she had mentioned some sort of biblical thing to me, you know, and which pulled at my, my heartstrings, oh. you know? So like, I went, I went back in. Um, and yeah, it's it it's was, difficult as rough. well, because when you, when you talk about uh, people, you know, using these experiences against you, a lot of the time, the end goal that that person will have in saying those things to you is pure like they are worried for your soul they're worried you know they they genuinely want you to come back to the church because they're worried about what will happen to you um but it's it's the methodology that's used and the negative thought impact that you know is 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 put onto you then the, the guilt um you know and the shaming um, you and, and it's almost like you're not going back to the church because you um, feel loved and welcomed and you miss these people and, and you have a yearning to be around these people. It's almost like you're going back there because you feel like you're damned either way. Yeah, it, you I mean, know, it, so and you're at your hard. lowest and you're at a point in your in your life where you're just like, uh, fuck, like what's. <laughs> you know i'm 23 years old like mm-hmm. you know expected to have like a long life with this kid and then now i'm yeah, seeing absolutely. i'm seeing him in my nightmares i'm seeing god i'm, I'm feeling the rapture because mm-hmm. it's like oh well now you know he's he's going to go to heaven and like if i want to see him because like we we long for this afterlife and mm-hmm. it's like if i mm-hmm. want to go to heaven to see this kid 
that again like my best friend who i mean i'll just shout was in love with like mm-hmm. i've even come to that point in my life where you know i can accept that i love i loved him like he mm-hmm. wasn't just my best like deeply loved him and yeah you know you want to be like well i want to see him again one day absolutely so then you try to you try to change again in order to fit this mold that you felt like that you feel like you have to but it's like a measure that you can't even obtain yeah it's yeah it's such an obtainable thing like or an unobtainable thing to reach of perfection to be Mm christ-like to And I wonder as well, I mean, how much of it's it's so hard to to lose somebody that you love, somebody that you're close to. It's so hard to go through that grieving process, that mourning process to, you know, to, to come to the realization that that person isn't there anymore. Um, it that is so, so difficult. You know, it's it's difficult with um you know, people who are getting older um, and, you know, or people that are unwell and have long term illnesses. But then for you to lose a friend so young that you thought you had so much time with and then to be told to come back to the church because that's the only way you'll see him again. Where does that grieving process come in? Like, where do you get the chance to mourn and to heal and to recover and to remember happy memories about this person? if you're promised you'll see them again at some point i don't understand how you can get that closure if you don't need that closure because you're going to be together again at some point no and there's so then they you know yeah there's no closure because it, all it is is just an opening up of wounds again absolutely yeah because of course. you're you're in the you know and at this point like when i had moved back and tried to go back to church you know because whatever feeling like oh i went to because they made me it made me feel like i had actually been i mean i this is going to sound ignorant as fuck okay but being in the mental hospital and because of how i was raised i actually thought that someone with schizophrenia had multiple demons okay yeah yeah because that's how it was explained to yeah, me yeah. when I call it. Because, of course, I'm calling my mom. I'm calling my pastor, who was my uncle at the time. Or still my uncle, but I'm saying, like, you know, he was my pastor. So I'm calling him, and, and he's, they're telling me these things. And so, you know, I get on the flight back. And so then I'm like, okay. Like, I, I, I kind of abstained away from a little bit. I tried to fight it. But then I mm-hmm. actually ended up going to church. And, you know, I did. I got down to kneel and pray, and they, like, tried to, like, cast like demons out of me and stuff which is um uh, almost like an infamous part of pentecostalism um a lot of people when they think about pentecostalism they think of snake handling which is the very um fringy parts of pentecostalism and it's not an everyday part of the practice but casting demons out of people it definitely is Yes. I mean, the, the, yeah, the snake handling is definitely a fringe and, you know, I had experienced the church, but without the snakes. Mm -hmm. Right. But like I had been to a church that was a handling church with what my other grandfather who had been in, who was in West Virginia. Oh, you did go to, to a snake handling church. Yeah. Yeah. There. So when we went in, like this is, I mean, I was very young. I think I was like around like uh, eight or nine, something like that, maybe 10. Um, so we go into this church and there are pictures on the wall and so (laughs) you're just like okay you know because like some like i've been to other churches where you go into the church and there's like a picture of the pastor and his wife or something right okay yeah but then there's like just a picture of one person 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 what all the same person 
No, just different people. And so you you question like, <clears throat> hey, hey, Papa, like, what are these pictures? And he's like, oh, those are people who took up like the serpent. Like these are like in memorial of. Like, oh no, snake handlers who have died. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So. How many pictures were there? If I remember correctly, there was at least like seven to eight eight like like something like that and i and i also don't know if my grandpa like now you know these could have been who knows these could have been just people and these could have been random people but my yeah. grand, but but you know what i'm saying but the but like these could have just been random people who had died but like there was no couples or like in memoriam of you know like this old couple but it was just like different variations but there was obviously like no kids i mean there were the kids mm -hmm. weren't like i don't think ever a part of that sort of thing but it was more or less like that's so strange yeah because then there's there's that more mortality aspect that comes into it you know how can you justify snake handling um because god is with you and if god will protect well, you and then your picture is up on the wall well you know you you weren't right with the lord <laughs> yeah uh, well yeah you'd be worried if you were the next person brought in for the job i think i'd be thinking about like God. a skirt i wore one summer that was a bit too short and i don't think right. i want to be the snake handler like god forbid you looked over at betty there who was showing an ankle you know. yeah exactly yeah oh my goodness so when you were <laughs> when you were invited to your best friend's wedding uh -huh. um, and you, you got to be um, best man, um, you mentioned that you, um, that you had to shave your beard. And obviously yeah. now you have a very long beard. Yeah. Um, before, even then, like, because I worked in the restaurant industry and mm -hmm. even earlier in my career, it was, you know, we had to keep it at least like shorter. So I've mm -hmm. kind of had just a very short, very short version of what I have now. So, okay. like, um, but either way, I still had to shave it off because men had to be clean shaven. Yes. Yeah. 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 And no sideburns, you know, um, no worldly haircuts. So your hair has to be like a, like a, you can't grow it past a certain length. You have to keep it like neat and tidy right like if it is a certain length like it can't go it's basically certain length past your ears sort okay. of thing, right so like you know you could have a bald spot up top and grow like your front forehead hair out you know three foot long to cover up your bald spot if you want to but as long as it doesn't come like down past your ears or or look like a little rat tail you know what I, like like pretty much like everything is clean shaven like all around the sides but up top I mean, you could pretty much have the Proud Boy haircut if you like, and you could go to heaven with a Proud Boy haircut. Like Proud Boy haircut, going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I think I talked about this in, in the interview with Amelia and David as well. It's weird that you have to be as proper on the outside as you are on the inside. Oh, yeah. Because I, I don't see how. Because if, if the temple is clean on the inside, then it's going to show on the outside. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose when you say it that way, that makes a bit more sense. But then I think to myself, like, what about people who are very devout and practice perfectly the Bible, the scripture, the verses, but don't have access to things like scissors, hairdresser, you know, hairdressers, uh, uh, mod modest mm. clothing, um, you know, baths, showers, clean water, um, toothbrushes you know that that type of thing does that does that mean that that yeah. person's not going to go to heaven because they don't have access to those things like it all you almost um you almost think you know and my mom and I joke about this all the time but like we legit don't feel like clean unless we have extremely hot water on us like right like it's it's yeah. like it's extreme and <laughs> like our skin is red when we get out sort of thing i mean mm -hmm, thankfully mm -hmm. thankfully my partner has taught me to moisturize you know, yeah like, especially in the winter when you come out and you're like yeah like a right. you feel your face go like 
and you're like oh yeah. no <laughs> yeah right so i'm like dang man like y'all were so worried about my soul you forgot to tell me how to moisturize like come on <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but yeah so like you know cleanliness is next to godliness being mm -hmm. able to be prim proper super you know suits like i i mean i know guys who I mean, one of one of my first things I bought with my paycheck after saving some money was a, was a brand new suit, which was like a three hundred dollars suit at the time. And this was like in 2002. You know what I'm saying? So like you spend the money. It's so weird because it's like you try to spend the money on these things in order to like try to feel like you are with the pastor. Yeah, because yeah. The, the pastor is able to afford these things. You know, and so you think that he's being blessed. You know, like I know one church, I know a uh, pastor of a church where the dude was driving a Lexus, him and his wife driving a brand new Lexus to church. And yet, you know, I could look down the down the parking lot and see, you know, a car that was 15, 20, 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what's going on here? You know, that sort of thing, like. I don't know. It, it's again, it's this unobtainable thing for people who are trying to reach this perfection. And they think that if they dress in this suit or if they look this way, or if they have the same sort of haircut, or if they do this, then they're going to be accepted and they're going to go to heaven. Like that's just it. And yeah. speaking in yeah. tongues thing, the speaking in tongues thing is, is in my opinion, is fake. Like you fake it. Yep. Like, you can't deny like no one in the church can deny that something actually made them trigger that like mm -hmm. i don't in my opinion like it's strange isn't it i all the people i've spoken strange. to like i say you know oh did you have that experience where you're standing in a circle speaking in gibberish looking around kind of thinking to yourself like i know i'm speaking gibberish but is everybody else actually speaking in tongues am i the only person that's faking it or do you look around the circle and go now i know all of you uh faking it i mean you have to think i was born into this and so i don't yep. know what someone's perspective is coming to into it as an adult i don't understand how as an adult that you you could accept that but as a kid at at five six years old you know on the front pew of your of the church and you got people around you and mm -hmm. they're you know you're praying i want the holy Ghost. you don't even all you know is that the holy ghost is whatever right like you just know that you want it like you don't even know what the fuck it is <laughs> yeah age, yeah what does it right? when it happens what do i what am i waiting for right so i don't like even at that age you don't even have a concept of like really like you can't have a concept of heaven and hell, you know, all you, you, but you have a concept of fire there. Right. And so that's how they view hell. And it's like, you don't even know what a, what a, what pearl or gold is at that age. Mm -hmm. Right. Like mm -hmm. you don't have any concept of like value to, to those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of thing sort of falls dead on a kid. But I think the, the, the realization that, there is a hell a hell can be more realistic than heaven in my opinion yeah and it's and it's it's dangerous to feed that information to children as well because people i've spoken to you know i was just just keep keep mentioning april's interview from from yesterday but she spoke about how she was terrified that because her father didn't believe um you know and he didn't go with her and her mum to the church and to services and stuff she was genuinely worried that he would go to hell and that he would burn in you know he would go up in flames and that must be terrifying for a child to grow up having those visions yeah. those thoughts you know one of your primary caregivers is going to be in pain and you know you're going to bed thinking about all the bad things that are going to happen to them because of the decisions that they're making that must be I mean awful I mean, you saw what happened to your stuffed animals when you called them dolls. So why the hell would you want it to happen oh, to you? Oh, yeah, of you course. Know what I, was, I, forgot right? to, good. I forgot about that as That's well. That's a good tie-in, wasn't it? That was a very good tie-in. Yeah, so I'm so proud of myself for that. <laughs> there was something that you mentioned in your notes about um, your grandfather and your father found mm -hmm. a collection of... Well... 
I, it, I remember we were just sitting around a table and talking about stuff. And I had mentioned that I had dolls and what I was, what I was talking about were, was my stuffed animals. Mm -hmm. And I called them dolls and they were like, my dad's face just pretty much went like ice cold. And my grandpa said, only queers have dolls sort of like sense, right? Like in that thing. Yeah. And then they took, his, I, my stuffed animals went out to a fire. Like they burnt my stuffed that's, animals. Oh my goodness. That's traumatic as a child. That's awful. So yeah. I mean, you know, you don't want that to like, <laughs> so when they relate heaven to hell or, you know, heaven and hell. And it's like, well, if you don't have the Holy ghost, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn up in a lake of fire. Oh, of course, thing. and you've seen you that know, happen to your to your teddies. And you're just like, what what the fuck is going oh, on? Oh, <laughs> that's yeah, and I suppose they're probably not even I don't think they probably I don't think they stood there and and thought to themselves, let's burn his teddy so that when we talk about fire in hell, that's what he'll associate it no. with. But of course, as a child, that's what's gonna happen. Yeah, like you, oh. yeah, they they did it as a to teach me a lesson to not call them dolls. Like it was just a very extreme way to teach me not to call them dolls, to be mm -hmm. a very, mm -hmm. you know, masculine, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Like, and yeah. that is, I think, quite telling about the perspective or views that your grandfather had and that pentecostalism has around the lgbtqia community oh yeah there is uh i mean there was a story that i i was i actually um was just told i'm allowed to to share most recently but like um in the 70s when this church thing was going on like at the school like there was a kid uh who would run away mm -hmm. and they would like he would go hide on this um like a strip mine Mm -hmm. and so they would like send out hunting parties to go find this kid out in the woods and in this mine or this old abandoned mine shut down mine or whatever and uh bring like basically beat him bring him back try to rebuke the devil out of him rebuke mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know the the homosexual spirit out of him and and stuff and it's, and it's he, very... he, he ran away because of because of his sexual orientation Mm -hmm. he, and he was a very small kid he was like oh. like around the ages of like uh i think i think he said it was uh the seventh grade was around the oh. time that he was in so it was like sixth seventh grade so he was like you know like 10 to 13 that's that so was, sad was, because that's happening. like the cusp of ch you know children becoming teenagers and learning about themselves and listening to their hormones and listening to their bodies and trying to understand all the changes that they're already going through and then to have these abusive experiences where these people that are supposed to love you and nurture you would would come and harm you and then drag you back to a place where they will then tell and you I mean, that everything you think and feel is wrong i it breaks it breaks my heart yeah, and terrible. with folks that i have talked with you know they they try to use i, I don't even want to say it's an excuse because i mean it's it's honestly just pretty much truth, but it's just the day and age and the time of, and the location, you know, just being so like being so rural and mm -hmm. being so far behind like society. And it, when you are sh basically cutting yourself off from yeah. the outside world and uh, from accepting new ideas, I mean, yeah. you become scared of change and scared of of things like this is what happens people buckle down and try to assert themselves as some mm -hmm. guiding light by being an authoritative figure and do you think that the mentality around it has changed at all in that specific area like no i i mean it's you know the abuse isn't the physical abuse isn't as loud as much you know i wouldn't say like you know my my brother being 12 years younger than me has um you know i i know that he had been whipped and things but like you know in the church services like we might get like slapped up against the arm or something like that like to make yeah. a point or you know if we're not paying attention you know but 
it's it's very different physical it's more i i think now it's more mental it's Mm -hmm. more psychological than it is with the physical stuff because Mm -hmm. so many people have been like well you know i'm not gonna get beat over the head and like for this like this is crazy but if you can have a preacher who takes count you know who is a, a a corrections officer and who takes counseling um, courses at, at a college and learns how to use psych. I mean, yep. You, but in his mind, using psychology and bio and the Bible together, to me, that's like maybe he's thinking maybe he's still helping. But yeah. from that outside perspective, it's like how can you like even as a pastor not see if the you damage. take these sort of yeah. classes? If you are taking these classes, how do you not see the damage that that? yes when you're being taught yeah yeah when you're being taught what different abuse looks like and the impact that that can have on on people but abuse is abuse at the end of the day whether it's sexual physical verbal neglect um you know you can't downplay either of them you know there's 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 no place for people to say um you know oh well they're only being shouted at they're not being they're not being struck because those two actions whether it's being shouted at or being struck can have the same impact on a person so the emotional manipulation and the emotional abuse that is inflicted on people in so many of these faith-based movements can't be downplayed by anybody um and a lot of the time, that's why people have to seek professional help when they leave these movements, because you almost have to rewire to get past all of the damage. Um, and I just, I just think about all these people that I speak to on a daily or weekly basis and people that come and share their stories. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg for the amount of people that this is happening to or, or has happened to it's devastating it's really yeah, really um, really heartbreaking i mean you know stories of with this you know and this one like kids p- being so scared that they pee themselves on the front pew oh like gosh. you know different things like that um story of a kid who was uh developmentally disabled wouldn't sit on the front row like sit wouldn't sit still kept wanting to go back to his mom and like you know being grabbed by the throat and basically just like slung back and like sat back down I mean so yeah I can understand like where you where a person would say this is me trying to help you Mm -hmm. but like at what point do you say well that's just that's a brave that's just pure out abuse like that's not like yeah that's not helping anyone. And at what point do people go from genuinely thinking that they are going to change the world, change the world for the better and or, or make a positive impact on someone's life to outright abusing the power that they have because they enjoy the, you know, the gratification that they get for themselves. I, I talk a, a bit about um you know jim jones and 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 the people's temple and and what happened at jonestown and when i did my deep dive research into jim jones there are accounts of him being extremely narcissistic and controlling and manipulative from a very young age but then again he did a lot for um communities for people of color and desegregation and he was involved in you know getting policies and and laws and and legislation changed and that might have been to feed his ego so he could say look at all the amazing things i've done but was there a part of jim jones that genuinely wanted to try and help people that genuinely wanted to change people for the better did he think that his message was the true message um you know was he struggling with some mental health there's all of these questions and then at what point did it turn to abuse of power to um you know to coercion um, to to use in the cult like tactics that he was using to get people to sign over their real estate to him before they even made the move over to Guyana, um, you know, sleep deprivation, um, food restrictions, rationing people's 
you know, people's um, daily intake of food and things like that. But there's a question with all of the nefarious cult leaders throughout history. You know, was there a point in their lives where they were trying to do good before the power took them over? I mean, I think, I think inherently, you know, men or women, whatever, start out as good, but if they start feeling like they're losing control, right? Like, it's not like, you know, they say God is in control anyway, right? But if, if people aren't falling under what they feel is correct, yeah you know, then it starts to become a little more rigorous because mm-hmm. it's like, well, now, you know, if you're following this already, well, now we have to add on this. Cause I mean, mom told me stories of like preachers preaching about deodorant, you know, like who could like, pre- like competing with each other of like, who could say, you know, well, we don't believe in this. Well, we don't believe in this. Well, yeah, well, we don't believe in this sort of like this I mean, sort of like this, you know, dick swinging club sort of mm-hmm, thing, you mm-hmm. know? And it's like, well, my people don't believe in Christmas. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, my people don't believe in wearing wedding bands. Yeah, well, my people don't believe in wearing dinner. Yeah, well, my people don't believe in wearing polyester or just, it's it's literally this like competition mm. between little dick men. Yeah, <laughs> and all the while the congregation's sitting there like looking left right left right like a right. game of tennis like, like trying to figure lead out us. Like, you're supposed to tell us what what's right and wrong and they're sitting there and they're like what polyester hang on what did he just say something about deodorant right. mm-hmm. it's interesting it's it's uh yeah i mean jim jones was an awful person awful terrible monster um i just would love to know if there was ever a stage where he started out with the best intentions and something just changed or whether he was always that way i mean it's and i guess we'll never know i wonder if it's the same for your your grandfather you know whether he started out with the best intentions and uh you know and then and then as you say you know when somebody feels or thinks a certain way or thinks that what they do or say or think or feel is right and somebody challenges that they they double down you know and people in positions of power if somebody steps out of line almost it's it's like okay well we're gonna double down now and i'm gonna use that information that you told me last week about your marriage and share it with this whole congregation so now i'm i'm on the i'm on the top step again and and you'll be put in in your place or like i was praying and you know, God told me that you were, uh, you know, that a young person in the church was doing this and you know, damn well that it was you, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And, and you know that, and, and there's that little person inside you that says someone told him. Yeah. But because you, you're supposed to follow this guy blindly, you feel like he has such like a direct, like, Telephone blind to god and, yeah yeah like blind to god that like which which just now talking about this cracks like i don't know i want to say cracks me up but it's like you know when when jesus died and the temple was rent like that took care of the part that you didn't have to go to to the direct like right like that meant you had a direct line with god right essentially so why like why do like why do they hold themselves to this like authority Mm -hmm. figure you know they act like this shepherd sort of mentality but yet they're not sheep you know and they want (laughs) to yeah yeah but in politics they're not sheep (laughs) yeah um we i feel like we could talk forever uh yeah yeah honestly yeah we definitely could we definitely could (laughs) i think the listeners are probably there like we've heard all this before Um, but i just i think it's absolutely fascinating um but let's go back to your beard so i mentioned that your beard is nice and long now is that Uh a product of lockdown or is that a product of i'm not part of the church anymore so i'll grow it as long as i want 
that is the product of yeah. I will grow it. I will do what I want. This is part of me taking control of, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do you have shorts on? No, no, it's cold. <laughs> it's, it's cold and snowy here. I mean, I have shorts under the pants that I'm wearing, but yeah, like it's cold here. So yeah. Yeah. Throw on some like pants, but I'm always, I mean, I have tattoos like all up and down my arms and I like summertime. I love to, I love to have the guns out. (laughs) Yeah. Sun's out, sun's out, guns out sort of thing. But, um, you know, I've just within the past few years, you know, with, I would say with therapy and with some uh, help of elite, like leaving a lot of my drinking behind and being more acceptive to you know um medical marijuana um even i i think you asked me to mention sort of like my uh experience with like mushrooms yeah and, that is definitely on my list yeah and you know i i would attribute the last you know few years of my life to that sort of head change of like okay like therapy awesome well, when you're eating mushrooms or with like acid, if you basically decide in my, like, this is how it works for me. Like I've decided to go in with an intent that I want to work through this. Mm-hmm. And. Oh, you, you know, mean that's what you, have, that's what you did before you took the LSD? No, the, the first time it just happened. Okay. It just, it happened without my control i had no i had no idea what the hell was going on Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like at all and i remember everything was fine at one point and then like i tried to fall asleep but then i came back too and it just seemed like i was in a different reality and you know i had like a really what they would consider a bad trip Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. and at one point i'm not gonna lie like i was praying to god at one point and I spoke in tongues <laughs> so which is really weird like I know it sounds weird but it's familiar right and so yeah. what happened and and what the what these things have have done for me the the tripping of w- with mushrooms and LSD it has basically allowed me to go through these experiences but then be like okay well that's what this means Okay. Right? Like there's no literal sense to like, for instance, like if you think you're dying, like if you, like I've had one of those like experiences where I felt like I was dying. Right. Well, no, I wasn't dying. I just wanted what was going on at that point in time to stop. Okay. Like, yeah. That, like, yeah. Right? So it, it's like, it helps like in my perspective, it has helped me look at things differently as opposed to being like very magical or whatever. It's like, okay, well it's somehow flipped the switch that like, a more logical sense of, of thinking. Right. Okay. For instance, like when I spoke in tongues, like it helped me realize that every time something bad happens to me or every time something negative or, or whatever it is, lose a job, life, you know what yep. I mean? Like yep. things that life happens. Yeah. It has nothing to do with with God. But every time like something bad happens, it seems like a lot of us decide to go back yeah to i guess it, it's like, like fight or flight is isn't it yeah you, and you we feel you, like our life is falling apart and mm-hmm. so we feel like we're going to go back to what's familiar yeah and where we got that support and where we were able to build up from before right because that's what we knew like we built mm-hmm. up but then it's like man you just keep it's a you just keep you're a loop you're you're basically you become a non-playable character in a video game and you're on a loop you're doing the same, you know, it's like every, every time you go back to that town, that person's doing the same thing. Yeah. 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 But, but yeah, I, that it was like sort of that separation for me that I'm no longer in a loop that like, I'm only moving forward now. There is no like going back to that because yeah, I I can't move forward because I kept going back to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, Mm -hmm. now that like, I've literally been gone the longest that I have been like at one time and I am more mentally, I would say sound. I am more financially sound. I am more uh, like, I'm not doing, I'm not rich, you know, by materialism by any means, but, Mm -hmm. but shit, I'm happy and I'm doing well, you know, like as far as like, I'm, I'm doing okay. Like I'm 
not just surviving like i'm doing yeah yeah okay. yep. and, and it's because i could attribute that yeah like, absolutely it's and it's and, and you know that. who can turn around and say that you'll never get to that level of fulfillment without god if that's what you've gone and done mm-hmm. right. so so let's go back to our timeline so you're okay. you, you move in 93 to west virginia and then yep. i'm gathering by the years you gave us earlier your brother's born in 95 90 i believe it was 96 i believe september Nin- so he, he's like one of those like for his a for his schooling he was young right okay. he was like yep. young, yep. Right? like one of the younger kids so it might have been 95 that's 95 probably so, not except, yeah probably 95 yeah. he's born in 95 or 96 and he's right. born in west virginia yeah yes in the capital city okay and he is obviously born into um pentecostalism um mm-hmm. and what do you think his early experiences are compared to yours is it i mean because you're not on the farm at this point and you're with your father's side of the family so do you think his early experiences um are different to yours in in any way oh for sure i i think you know for him um you know he was more into wanting wanting to play sports okay right and wasn't allowed to play sports and so his i would say his upbringing was at least from my parents like like with my parents it was probably more physical than mine i wasn't at, i was very more i was a lot more docile as a kid okay like um didn't really fight against like i i apparently i was my mom said that i was grumpy a lot as a kid and i cried a lot as a kid <laughs> but i was also just very happy compassionate like was never bad really like i, right. I mean yeah. i, I yeah. did get I did get spanked a few times with a belt once with a coat hanger, like sort of oh whatever goodness. you got wanted to get whipped with or whatever, but it's like, how is that justified it, well, then? Uh, it was the only thing she had, I don't guess. Like, That's you know, I mean, there's awful. been switch, there's been switches too. So, I mean, you know, growing up old, old style Pentecostal, I mean, you just think that, you know, being whipped is just part of, part of correction what does it does it say that like is that justified in like do they use scripture to justify beating children uh what uh, maybe like the or is it just common practice just sort of common practice oh that's oh what is it i think it was in the movie but like spare the rod and beat the child or something oh (laughs) there's just so many elements to 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 your upbringing and your story and and all the different levels of abuse that just i uh, just yeah, have I me mean, like baffled being, have me shaking yeah, my just head being smacked you know at any given time i mean yeah like it so just... if if you're do- like your dose are like you said and you're agreeable and then your brother is born and he's the, kind of almost like the opposite of that i mean what was it like I, for him because your parents are older oh at this God. point so yeah. you know are they have they dialed it back a little bit are, are they as, i mean as, and, and they're away from you know your grandfather's extremism as well so mm-hmm. is it you know does he have it a little bit easier i would say he yeah like he had a little bit easier but you know his i guess like temper or whatever would get him in trouble or you know at school he would kick he he like one time he went he got banned from wearing cowboy boots because he he would kept kicking people because he'd get mad at them and kick them. Okay. And I mean, and that to me is just a, a frustration. Like frustration. And yeah. if you're learning that as a, I did the same thing too as a kid, as a very young kid. Like I used to, uh, I would get in trouble for fighting mm-hmm. and things because, uh, like at school, because if I someone made me mad. Yeah. My thing was violence. Yeah. I mean, especially if if it's you know, your um differences that are being picked on, you know, your long sleeves mm-hmm. and, and things that we spoke about before. Right. Um, and like my mom, you know, was I always attribute like just this calmness to her, right? Like that I am but at the same time I could be very 
angry like if pushed mm-hmm. to a, yeah a, a, yeah right like there is some sort of patience there but you know I was raised like my dad wasn't around a lot either as a kid and so like they were split up a lot but my and I guess that's the differences too that you can see between my brother and I is that I was raised by my mother fully and my dad was raised by or my brother was raised by my dad because my dad got hurt and so then he was around a lot more right yeah right, yeah so. and you've moved over to his almost his territory his, ter- his territory right yeah exactly yeah. and so yeah things are a little bit different you know I mean I remember one time like getting older like going to work with him and he and he was also supposed to be a preacher as well like right, right? like but you know he had these odd jobs and like we go to I'd go to work with him and we deliver flowers and he would be listening to like secular music and I would just be like what and then he would go and preach a sermon you know <laughs> so, so I mean obviously you spoke a lot about um in your notes about your family being in the almost like the inner circle um of of of, of their the respective movements and then you've just said there that you know your father would go and preach a sermon so was there do you think there was ever a level of expectation that you or your brother would also go down the route of being a preacher or pastor oh yeah I was told as a kid that I was called to be a preacher like there was legit a um my it was my it was my grandpa my mom's side it was his sister called my mom and told her that she had had she had been praying and had a vision from God or a dream or something like something along those lines that I had been called to preach and so I was like, you know, mom tells me this and I'm just like, all right, like, I don't really know, you know, you get this excitement because it's like, oh no, you know, like at this point in time, you know, like I'm starting to understand the, you know, the thing behind like this power, and the, you know, this powerfulness of God or whatever. And how, yeah. like, if, if, if these other men have a th- who have authority have this direct line you know to god like if i'm being called by god then yes like i now i have this like mm-hmm. special power sort a of purpose thing, right? almost yeah but, yeah mm-hmm. and i put a and weirdly like i put out a they call it a they called it a fleece which is basically like in this bible there's this uh guy named gideon, gideon who you know puts out like uh wool's flea you know sheep's fleece like wool or whatever right and to- tells god that if he's meant to lead then the dew or whatever is supposed to be like the the garment is supposed to be wet okay while the ground while the ground around it is dry okay and so then the next one he put a wet one out and was like well now the the coat needs to be dry and the ground needs to be wet so it was like this two okay. times sort of yeah. test, right okay so i've you know, being a kid just did the same thing. Like I prayed to God and I was like, well, Hey man, there, I mean, I'm just paraphrasing obviously now, but I'm like, Hey, (laughs) there there are these two dudes, uh, who are, uh, trying to, you know, receive the Holy ghost. And if I am to be called of you, then one of them should get the Holy ghost. Right. Yeah. I shit you not that very night in the service, both of them, quote unquote got the holy ghost right like started speaking in tongues that night and right shit. yeah so and you're like, like... As a, yeah and so like even as a kid though when you think that like you are like well is this real or fake and you start speaking and then they tell you that you got it and so you think that all right well this is me speaking in tongues like you get older you start more accepting it right like it's almost like as a kid, I, as a very young child, I remember questioning, but then the older I got, I did, I started questioning less, but then I started, it was like this weird, like, yeah, ebb and flow of like, I'm questioning less, I'm questioning more, I'm questioning less, I'm questioning more, because I saw a lot of, hypocr- like, a lot of hypocrites, like, just people being, you know, preaching about these, you know, they're saying that a Pharisee and a Sadducee is a sinner, but yet here they are doing the same fucking thing, <laughs> like, so i've made a few notes here about things that we've spoken about that i wanted to go back over um Uh but i so i just wanted to finish sort of finish your your timeline here which is um i think 
you mentioned that in 2000 you made the move back over to Ohio. Mm -hmm. So did you I move was back? In 11th grade. You were in 11th grade and you moved back to the farm? Um, well, no, the farm had been sold. Like my grandfather had, right. uh, my grandma, my grandmother, his wife died in 94 from complications due to diabetes. Okay. Uh, they wouldn't take her to the hospital. Uh, she wouldn't go to a doctor, you know, sort of that faith healing. Right. Of okay. Um, so she passed away from complications of diabetes. Right. Grandpa losing, um, they were losing members. A lot of people had left okay and so it just became too much and so he basically s sold it scaled down and moved into this other little village that wasn't too far from the old farm so it was maybe about like five miles away but it's right. like this um village sort of thing and okay yeah started a new church and called it a different name and okay yeah. so he carried he, he carried on with his work even after mm -hmm. the move so, yep, and now my uncle is the pastor. My mom's brother is now your the mom's pastor. brother, right? So, mm -hmm. um, when you move back to Ohio, you move back to this. You you go, you move to this town that your grandfather lives in, mm -hmm. and you attend his church. Yes, and your yep. brother's around about five years old at this time. That would make yeah. That would be about that would be about right. Yeah, mm -hmm. he would start. He was about to start like uh, yeah, like school. Um, so, so my grandfather had died previous to this as well. So it was just my uncle who. Right. Okay. So did yeah. your brother ever meet your grandfather? Um, for a very short time. I think, okay. you know, my uncle, my brother was like two when my grandfather died. Right. Like okay. Two. Okay. So. I was just curious as to whether your brother ever experienced um, your, your grandfather and his um, charismatic ways. <laughs> no, but he experienced it through my uncle, who is right. the spitting image of my grandpa. And he was also the same kind of um, charismatic, um, yes, brimstone as as you as you described your grandfather before. Yeah, the hellfire brimstone in your face, like red yeah. face, like screaming with a finger pointing at you, you know, sort of thing, and you know, whole sort of, <laughs> but you know, again, like there was that balance with my grandmother, right? Like my mom's mom, who was like way more, way more caring, I guess, and mm -hmm. way more nurturing. Right. And so yeah. my uncle had that. So my uncle was way more nurturing emotionally, okay. but also, but also the exact same as my grandfather, when it came to doing what the Bible says or doing what the word of God, you know, whatever the preacher preaching is saying for that. Evening. Yeah. 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 So um, when you mentioned that your brother had experienced, you know, his own um, physical abuse through things like whipping um, where, what part of the world are you in when he has those experiences? Um, I am. So as I mentioned, I was like a chef. Uh, for a few years you know for yeah. 15 plus years so um at this point in time I'm just I'm either Las Vegas at one point um I'm in Columbus Ohio at one point which is like the capital of um Ohio okay um you know I've just been West Virginia same like as adults it's almost like I have not only have I revisited West Virginia as an adult but I've also, I'm living in the same area that I grew up in just okay. because like, I mean, personally, I, I love living in this little blue area, but like, you know, I still have the, it's still affordable enough for me to like travel to places if yeah, I want to, yeah, you yeah. know, and I'm still close enough to like some major cities. So I'm okay with, you know, being, being here. Yeah. But. So you're, you're. <laughs> you're working and traveling around at this point where you're getting experience. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel helped a lot with my cultural experience as a being more accepting of other people. Cause I've had to work with people who were from completely different countries, completely yeah, different yeah. backgrounds, completely different beliefs. I mean, I also went to, um, you know, in culinary school, I had to take some English courses and we were, uh, we read a lot of, 
uh, you know, person of color, like literature and things. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. I, I learned a lot about my generalized vocabulary, as you could call it. Like if yeah. I would say things like just, I mean, in my opinion, just ignore white things to say, like, mm -hmm. like those people or, you know, when referring to certain folks, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. I, I think, and that's got to have helped with your recovery from, um, you know, leaving the church for good as oh, well, sure. you know, to have these experiences with people from different countries and cultures and uh, they have their own faith systems for where they're from and practice their own, you know, religions and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just wanted to go back to you. You started talking about when um, your uh, grandfather tried to cast a demon out of you. Um, oh no, this was my uncle. Your uncle, sorry. So your uncle, yeah, yeah. who's taken over from your grandfather, wants to cast mm -hmm. a demon from you. Um, what yeah. what does that entail? I mean, talk us through that experience. Um. So just F, like FYI, this will be the second, like I just opened up with this with my partner okay. the other night because I was kind of getting ready for the show. Okay, yeah, yeah. So this is the first time that I will be talking about this as well. Like also, okay. okay. Um, so that, that experience, um, you know, I, I had moved back to Ohio and this is because I had been into the, mental hospital when I was in Las Vegas right like when mm -hmm. I lived out there so moved back and had abstained from going to the church because I was like no like you know whatever like I don't I do this all the time I don't want to go back like I know what it's going to be like you yeah know, and you try you try to deny it but then you know eventually like mom comes home from church you know because at this time I was living at, at home um, yeah yeah we're back with them and so I'm like sitting there going well you know maybe maybe if I do like it'll you know it'll help something like just alleviate like whatever's going on in my head sort of thing yeah. and then you know mom would come home and be like oh we had this preacher here and oh they had this message and they said this and this and I just think that it would be you know good for you or, or whatever so yeah you give up and you go and so I'm at the church and um you know I'm sitting in the pew with my mom and just they know what songs to sing too you know like when they know that like an old like convert especially like someone like me like you know I'm his nephew and super involved in the church growing up like just kind of knows me you know so yeah, it almost yeah. feels like they know what song is going to hit my heart or whatever oh, gosh okay and so <laughs> you know they start singing these old old hymns and so like I started thinking about you know everything and they start uh, I don't even basically you don't even make it to like preaching at this point usually like when it's like a new convert coming back like sometimes it doesn't even make it through to the preaching. right okay so the whole service is focused on you at this point mm -hmm. right okay and so yeah and it's like i don't i at least that's the perspective i have now right like at that point you don't think that the, that is focused on you you just think that you're there with your mom and you're of course just yeah we're going through the motions or whatever but you know you start feeling you know, all these things in your head about how much, you know, you, have, how hard your life has been and like, oh yeah, you know, you did all these drugs and you went to, you know, the mental hospital and mm -hmm. you played, um, you know, you played checkers against someone who was schizophrenic, but really they had demons and, you know, like yeah, yeah. that sort of thing. So you're thinking of all this stuff and, you know, and of course, you start crying and then all of a sudden you're just like, well, you know, I feel compelled to just sort of get down and just pray and like talk to God. And so you do. Right. And then one person comes around and then another person comes and then, another, and then it's like this flock. Right. And I'll get around you. And the preacher finally comes at one point. Right. And he's like kneeling down with you and he's talking to you. And, and like, honestly, like I told, I told my partner the other night, like, I don't even know what, what made this happen. Right. Okay. And at some point when my uncle was there, I jerked away from him 
Yeah. Right. Like I was just like, like sort of like get away from me. Like I really just, I, but in my mind, like, I really don't want anyone with me right now. Like I'm trying to have this this personal conversation with God, but I got all these people around me and they can hear what I'm saying. And I'm trying to be as, you know, as, as, as truthful to God as I can be, right? But it's like if you already know your heart, whatever. Like we won't get that discussion at the moment. But it's like you're you know acknowledging all these things, and then but you don't want people to hear what you've been through, or like you don't want to tell your deep dark secrets to a whole crowd of people, the yeah. church, you know. So I think a lot of it was like I wanted to get the fuck away, but. Right. Um, I did. I like jerks. And then that made it even stronger. They started like praying for me harder. Oh, gosh. Uh, they are laying their hands on my head. I'm being like wrapped around my like wrists or being held to the ground. And I mean, oh, gosh. I'm I'm six, four, 300 plus pounds. Like I'm not a small dude by any means. And so there's literally six to like seven people trying to like hold me back. Right. Yeah. Like Cause I'm literally trying to like struggle to get out. Cause like, I don't want to be held. And at one point I remember I, they tell me this was like demon strength, but you know, I'm in between mm. these two pews and like, I went and like lifted the pews up, like mm-hmm. to try to get like out or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they're still trying to say that that's me being like de- demonic, you know, whatever. Oh. So I finally get in and just lay there and I start praying again or whatever. And then I, in my head, I'm like, all right, man, just speak in tongues. And so I started speaking and then they told me that it wasn't real, that they told me that that was the devil speaking out of me. And then I like stopped for a minute and just stood like lay there for, you know what I'm saying? Like just stopped and like yeah. gathered myself. And I was like, and I'm crying and I'm being very emotional in all this at, at one point as well. Right. So yeah, but yeah. It's still inside my head, I'm trying to like, just get this all to like sort of go away. And so I started listening to the people around me and yeah. then I followed their can their like basically a cadence. And because I was in that emotional state, I was able to basically mimic what they like what others were doing, but sort of in my own like like I made it my own, I guess, somehow. And then everybody started rejoicing and telling me that I'd been delivered. And then they used okay. my experience for, as a withdrawal to tell another young um teenager in the church that the that my demon had went left me and went into him oh <laughs> that was called the demon of uh, manipulation they call oh it. gosh yeah that so so that all stems from them thinking that when your uncle touched your arm it was the demon moving away from him because he's god's messenger right and because I didn't want anyone around me to hear what I was saying, basically, right? Like, I was trying to, like, move away to, like, kind of yeah. just be buried buried in my own arms, sort of, to pray. And, yeah. And then you're kind of just um, left, like, feeling, like, violated after the whole thing. Pretty you know? much. And still, you know, being ma- told that, like, it was the devil, you know, and all this stuff. So, yeah, fun times that is that sounds like another horrible situation that you have found yourself in because again just because of this faith as well um i did want to quickly mention though that somebody commented on on uh my my reddit post i i posted in the in the cult subreddit yesterday just uh saying you know my episode is here for anyone that might want to listen um and somebody commented on it saying well i attended a a pentecostal um meeting and at the end of it you know the doors were open for me to leave you know i didn't see anything hear anything nefarious um which is not a bad thing you know that's a good thing it's a good thing that that's the experience you had you know you had a positive exchange with the church I'm not here to say that every single church, every single branch, every, every practicing part of of Pentecostalism is going to be using cult-like methods of control over its members. Um, 
but you know you, and visitors you, are one thing exactly yeah and that's another thing to take into consideration you know uh, that, that i i've spoken about um i've spoken to, to to one person on the podcast who was part of um you know part of a a, a catholic movement um that wasn't necessarily cult-like in its methods but the father of the house took that catholicism so literally that he would enforce cult-like methods within the household that only had four members so you know i'm, I'm not saying that all of pentecostalism is a cult um i'm i'm just going by the responses that that you know people such as you, yourself have in to Stephen hassan's bite model you know where we go through all the points and you can apply experiences to almost every single point in that model. And that model exists to ascertain the level of control that a group has over its members. Um, so that's not to say that every single, like yesterday I spoke to April, that's not to say that every single congregation that follows the assembly of God is going to be using those types of control methods. It's just unfortunate that there seems to be a lot of people that come forward with these testimonials and and you know and can can testify that that these groups do exist and are using you know the these these methods i mean there's another <clears throat> sex that we went to um that they sort of believe the same along along the same lines as pentecostalism or yeah. you know the the upci group except the name over the door has to be uh it's called the church just the church of jesus christ is what it has to be is what it has to say right R right and so it's the church of jesus christ and then if you anytime you say the name jesus you have to say jesus christ if you say if you baptize it's no longer being baptized in jesus name which is what a lot of pentecost does yeah they baptize yeah. in the name of jesus christ like okay. you just have to say you have to say Christ anytime you say Jesus. Like it's right. like there, I mean, we went to that church for a little bit too. Right. And they are like, they were like super nice people, but just super ignorant, like culty weird, like just back mm -hmm. hill mm -hmm. sort of thing. It seemed, I don't know. Like it was just, mm -hmm. it's like, especially even now, like as an adult like then i thought it was just all normal you know i thought it was slightly weird but just different right like i just like different but now that i'm a yeah older and i've been away from it for a minute it's just all very weird yeah yeah <laughs> and and so you, you've been out now for six years um, yeah i would say strongly yeah out for six years now and you mentioned right. that the turning point for you was when you turned 30 and had these um, experiences with various recreational drugs. Um, yes. You know, and that, that was the turning point for you to be able to finally <laughs> say, you know, th 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 this faith is something that I need to distance myself from permanently. Yeah, I mean, before, um, I had never, you know, experienced hallucinogens before that time. And <laughs> before then it was just, you know, it was like the other, the party drugs or like cocaine, you know, like marijuana, um, you know, that pills sort of stuff. Right. So yeah, yeah. going from, and I, I mean, now it's like no chemical sort of thing now, like I'm a straight, like I, I do have my medical card, like we have medical marijuana here in, in Ohio and just legalized. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have my card. Um, but you know the hallucinogens are still sort of obviously on the on the black side of the market of in certain states and things yes, right yeah and so you know obtaining these things are you know sometimes you can get screwed i guess in a sense but um you know if you can find something that's trustworthy like do your own you know do your own like whatever like i think that uh they can be beneficial only because again they helped me process things mm -hmm. differently and not to hold so much guilt to myself anymore right. like okay. don't get yeah. me wrong i'm yeah. not saying this look and i'm not saying this is like a fix-all because i still have my times i still have my days i still have my weeks yeah you know? yeah 
where I ha- I still deal with the PTSD of all this mm-hmm. stuff. Like, mm-hmm. you know, nightmares waking up because I feel like, um, you know, I-, I have like a dream about hell or something. Or if I can't get a hold of my mom, instant anxiety yeah. that the rapture has happened. Yeah, yeah. You know, like stuff like that. So it- I still deal with it, but I'm just saying that it's it's helped me not to get as deeply involved with right okay how, how so, sad or how things are yeah it's it's obviously um something that's worked well for yourself for um me, yes so w- what what we should be what we should say here is if this is something that the listeners think could help them sounds appealing to them um make sure if you ever did decide that it was something you wanted to try, make sure you do extensive research around research. taking hallucinogenics. Oh, um, please. My, yeah. my, any kind of mind altering drug, you need to make sure you do extensive research. Um, I'm not advocating drug taking whatsoever by saying this, um, but you know, you need to um, make sure that you, um, that you have somebody with you that's not taken um, this is true. any substances so you know there's a lot I, I i haven't personally had any experiences um with uh lsd or acid or anything like that um but i know through some of the training that i've had that it's important to to just um make sure that you read up and understand w- what you are um potentially going to be experiencing um and to make sure that you're in, a, in an environment that you trust and to understand yeah. doses, um, especially if you've never tried anything like that before. Um, so if what Sam has said today is something that you think could be beneficial to you in your healing journey, um, then please do lots of research. But also if you are somebody who is predispositioned to um, to have um, problems with your mental health then it it's probably not something that's recommended this is yeah this is also very true um because i mean just from experiences it does from what i can understand it can set you in sort of a sometimes put you in a um schizophrenic state where you feel like there are multiple entities or voices talking to you or you see things that aren't there and yeah. You know, but what I can say for my everyday to life is that you have the realization, hey, I am on this. It's I have control over this. Right. Like, it's like if that's that was the only thing I can say that was like that was really breaking for me was the fact that, like, I realized that I have control over how I react to what is happening to me. Right. Like, yeah. I can't control my emotions. I can't control anything like that. And it's not my fault that I have these emotions, but it is my responsibility to control the, how I react to situations. Correct. So instead of hurting myself, I go out and I walk, you know, go out and try to find nature, find something other than self abuse in order to like try to get through the pain for sure. Yeah. I mean, I've attempted suicide a few times. I've, you know, there, I've been through all, a lot of these things, but I'm not, and I'm not even saying I'm 100% better. I'm not even, you know, who knows what <laughs> if I say this all the time, who knows what the future holds? I have no idea. I'm just saying at this point in time in my life, I am, a, I am better mentally than I have ever been. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I attribute it to a lot of it to my therapist. Like, that's the, I I will say that over any drug, any self medication you could do to yourself, mm-hmm. having someone that you can unequivocally trust to talk to and tell, you know, your deepest fears and you mm-hmm. know your anxieties, and then they help you. Do, they'll t- they're going to tell you the same thing, like how to, yeah. You know, basically stop and react in a positive way instead of reacting negatively, which is how you're taught to do things you're taught to view negatively about yourself yeah you know and all these sort of self-humiliation things of well you know being even being used in a sermon you know to be pointed at as as an example of certain things like 
it's yeah it's it's it takes a lot of work but i'm here to tell everybody that it you know yeah if anyone, if anyone out there is listening that's having a hard time with this like mm-hmm. it gets better and we've there. spoken about some extremely sensitive themes today you know and, and we've talked about things that i can only imagine have been very difficult for you to open up about um and recall and and relive and you know um some of the worst crimes against a human being um that can be done uh have been inflicted on you throughout your life and you have experienced these things but what you have come here to tell us today is that there is um you know, it, it. You're not always going to be just treading water and keep keeping your head, you know, above the water. There is, there is a way to get yourself out of that position. You know, there is um, a a way to think positively about yourself, to take back some of that control, and to change your narrative and to make things better for yourself. Um, you know, that 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 there doesn't always have to be you feeling like the victim because you can go out and you can take back some of that control of your life and you can go to therapy. You can seek professional help. You can look up on the internet, um, you know, ways to support yourself and put support systems in place for you to recover and to heal, you know, and it sounds as if your partner is another person that you can speak to, that you can trust is somebody that is, you know, holding your hand through these things as you work through them. So you're almost like, very lucky. It's like an example again, not of somebody having a demon cast out of them, but somebody who can rebuild on all of those awful things that have happened. You're somebody who can sit here today and say, you know, that doesn't have to be what your life is. You can take back power and change it for yourself for the better and and you know you're sitting here today you've got a um a cap on with a picture of a sheep uh it says black sheep you know yeah i wore it to thanksgiving i wore it to socially distance thanksgiving which was at the farm so. oh was it see <laughs> yeah. this is what i mean like you, you know your 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 beard is long um you're just you know you're you're I just think it's incredible that you can sit here today um and just and just tell everybody these things that have happened but also tell them that it doesn't have to just end at that point no I mean yeah they have the semicolon is like the you know sort of the the symbol for you know suicide awareness and it's it's true like our story doesn't have to end like you just you can choose you know don't be afraid to try new things and to experience new things um because you know after a, a long time of being told certain things are a sin or whatever like you know you are gonna want to experience all that stuff but at some point you realize that moderation is like the key <laughs> not and not to like go extreme because but that's all we know that's all we know is to go extreme all we know is to is to be the hardest christian to be the to be the most you know perfect to do this and so when we drink we drink the hardest when we do we, like serious you know i like that's how i've been the my my entire like time in and out of church is just realizing that yeah, it, it all has to do with how I was brought up. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like ever as an adult, it's yeah. But you don't have to. Again, you don't have to stay there. You just I I have found art. Like I paint. Um, I try to, you know, play music or I, and I love to listen to music. Like it's, and I mean, even every once in a while, I listen to some old Christian music. But like mm-hmm. you, you don't have to allow your. You can allow yourself that joy that it brings you. Right. Like yeah. Yeah, because there there is like certain songs that allow me joy, and like I have come to the terms that like I'm allowed to enjoy this, but yeah. I don't have to allow it to take me down that deep dark path of that I went that I lived through. You know, like I mm-hmm. I appreciate the song and I appreciate the music for what it is, and it makes me feel like a kid again, and that's mm-hmm. that's how mm-hmm. it works. But yeah, just don't get too caught up in the loop. Don't be an NPC break your mold yeah 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 you know be 
be in your thirties and watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Hell yeah! Right. I mean, <laughs> watch watch Big Mouth. Good lord, that can oh teach you a goodness. lot. Oh my goodness! Oh, that show like, is hilarious, isn't it? I was it? like, where was this when I was, you know, like yeah. ten? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny. Um, so, um, before I hand it over to you to ask if there's anything you think we've missed, I just wanted to um quickly mention that you um have started recording your own podcast, which will um, include you know I'm, I'm sure many more of the experiences that you had in the church as well as other people's experiences that they had in the church that you, you will gather information from um, others that you grew up with and you're planning on calling that podcast Harvest Time which I think is an awesome name for a podcast. Oh thanks. Um, uh- yeah, even when I did the research, the only other thing that came up was like it's actual. There's like an actual church. It's called like Harvest Church or something, and they have a podcast. But I'm like, I'll compete with them. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think I think it would definitely be content that that people will be interested in listening to. I know I would definitely be interested in listening. I could sit here and oh, talk awesome. all all night. Um, unfortunately, uh, being in different time zones, it's getting quite late over right. here. Um, so, um, you're going to be launching, um, harvest time, which I will let the listeners know, give a little update when that goes live. If you, um, if you drop a message to let us know. Um, so we've talked about, um, you growing up, moving all over the place, being a chef for 15 years. Um, I should probably mention to the listeners that, um, you did do amateur stand up at one point as well. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. so now you're working in, um, with medical cannabis and you're in therapy and your partner is awesome and, and super supportive and you're living in a part of the world that, um, makes you feel, um, um content and you're in a good place with your life um so is there any advice that you would give to anyone who is looking to leave their own church or their own movement yeah i i think um you know one of my favorite books is dr seuss's uh green eggs and ham and i think and I give that to all of my little, like I have a niece, right? And I give it to all my like little adopted like nieces and nephews. Mm-hmm. And, you know, basically I just don't be afraid. I like basically to me, the big gist of that story is don't be afraid to like try new things, but, you know, don't be afraid to try something that can give you as much satisfaction as you thought you felt within the cults or within mm-hmm. the church. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, um, if you, I don't know, you can only get better with whatever you do. Like I, I, with painting, I used to be so insecure about it, but now I've like started to realize that like, I can do these things, Mm -hmm. you know, as long as you're willing to put the time and the, you want to invest and especially even relating that to mental health, like you can get over this and yeah, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to want to try to give, you know folks advice but it's just you know i think you've you, given some be free free. you know like just be free read yeah. dr seuss man let's be happy and try to yeah Make i think it. you've given some wonderful snippets throughout our conversation <laughs> on um, and on some positive directions that people can can move in so is there anything you wanted to cover that you think we've missed before we uh before we end the call today no, I mean, I think we've covered everything pretty well. I feel um, very, very good about this. And, you know, I, I appreciate you having me on the podcast. And, uh, yeah, I, I look forward to doing my own, especially now um, that I've kind of talked this out. I will say that probably the first episode will be a little more about my story again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So maybe just a little more, um, if I can try to <laughs> outline it a little bit more. But, yeah i hope to see future and i hope you and i can continue you know some sort of uh conversation whether it's on reddit or through email or whatever like absolutely is- yeah i'm i'm so privileged to uh to be able to sit down with people and have them share their experiences and stories with me um 
And uh, as I said before, we started um, recording today. Um, I've sp spoken to a few people um, who, you know, identify under the umbrella of Pentecostalism. And even though some of the practices across the different branches are similar, everybody's stories are so different. Um, and, and you've come here today and proved me right exactly because <laughs> your story is so different to people's that I've, you know, other people that I've spoken to, but it's so, so similar and recognizable in the way that those cult-like methods of control were used and inflicted on you throughout, you know, your childhood and, and stuff like that. So I'm just really appreciative and thankful for you to sit down and, and share that information with me today. I know it can't be easy. And I just think you're an inspiration to people who are going to be looking to move out of their own movement, move away, um, make those big changes in life um, for the better and to help themselves and, and just make, make the situation better for themselves. So thank you so much, Sam, for your time today. I really hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thanks. Bye. That is the end of this week's episode. If you'd like to get in touch, you can do so by emailing me at coltvoltpodcast at gmail.com or finding me on Twitter and Instagram at coltvoltpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, and this is the Cult Vault. <laughs>